have internalized it. Uh, am I saying that that's all negative? Not necessary. There are some things about that that we all need. We all need to be respected, to be seen, to be uh, trust, which was an old value word here. I am trusted, but I am trusted to serve the system for as long as I don't question it. I am trusted to do my job for as long as I do my job. I am trusted to sit everywhere for as long as I know where I should not sit. And, and therefore, we don't even need to talk about it. We don't even need to create laws about it because if you internalize it, you are free and this is, this is your, the space is your freedom. And if you grow a little bit more, maybe you have more space. And if you grow a little bit more, maybe, you know. Uh, so it's a very restricted sense of freedom. Could you tell us about some of the supporting the events and the publication to Momentous Times? Sure, so um, the publication is the one place where all of the associated exhibitions come together. So we're not the only people who thought it was a good idea to look at the centenary of the lockout. Um, we worked especially closely with Helen Carey at Limerick City Gallery. And so there are contributions from that exhibition in the newspaper. There's an introduction from us, uh, essentially framing um, the show. There's an introduction from Marina Verschmitz perspective and she's the person who we um, worked with to organize uh, the seminars that we called forums. Um, we really think of the process of making exhibitions as a learning process for ourselves so even by the time an exhibition opens uh, we don't feel like we have a, a whole grasp on um, whatever uh, ideas framing the exhibition so uh, part of our process of learning about um, the history of labor conditions in Derry was to commission Emmett O'Connor, who's a, a labor historian, um, especially focused on Irish labor history. He happens also to live in Derry. So we started a conversation with him and he writes an introduction to um, what the 1913 moment was like in Derry. And for us, it's really interesting because in fact, um, people didn't want to organize. They didn't want to join Larkin mm. in Derry. And, um, especially the women's workforce, maybe because it's, it was precarious then as it tends to be today and is in, uh, based around the shirt factories in Derry at that time, the women especially didn't want to be unionized. Okay. And I think that's really interesting. So um, the newspaper brings together a number of threads and conversations and kind of makes them public and allows them to circulate in a way that the show can't. Mm. And is there a kind of connection to just um, obviously the the kind of it's a Dublin lockout, so it's like much more like a centenary of something that happened in more famously in Dublin. But yeah. in a way, is there a, how does that reflect on that kind of non-participation in 1913? How does that reflect on kind of a kind of labour tradition in Derry leading up to the kind of present? I think the interesting thing about Larkin was he was from Liverpool, he was mm. from an Irish family in Liverpool, and he uh, uh, his kind of place in Irish labour history is quite interesting because. The lockout also was seen as a failure in many ways. He fled to the United States afterwards and then actually got imprisoned and then eventually returned to, to Ireland. But it's, it's, it was kind of a, there was a, there were labor disputes in almost every European country at that point in the early 20th century. So Larkin was kind of uh, very inspired what was happening in Russia, for example, at the mm. time. And he was trying to rally kind of uh, people and bring awareness. Um, he was quite an outspoken socialist. And I think what happened in Ireland was quite interesting that he, he came here and he felt like there was a lot of uh, potential. People were quite unhappy. Uh, um, Dublin was the, the poorest city in the British Empire at, the, mm. at that time. So he felt like he was... Uh, a moment that he could kind of uh, organize people and get them excited by socialist ideas, not. But what happened, of course, between 1913 and 1916 is that the Catholic Church kind of came in and took over as the kind of the, the main conduit for, for the, the kind of revolution that led to, to um, the forming of the Republic. And I think yesterday in the forum, in the forum Eamon McCann unpacked this very kind of neatly in a couple of sentences just to say that whatever um, discontent there was that Larkin was drawing together in a kind of labor movement, uh, that kind of energy uh, was then channeled into a, a nationalist mm. program and toward the Easter Rising and eventually the formation of the state of Ireland. And so uh, it had a kind of nationalist drive rather than one uh, related to labor conditions. And in his opinion, or at least as he spoke yesterday, it didn't ever really recover its kind of 
position. He talked about the way that kind of um, trade unions were, did participate in the kind of 1916 uprising, yeah. but as kind of subsumed under this kind of exactly. both Catholic and national framework, which I think is kind of interesting for just like yeah. a, in a way, a whole history of how kind of maybe labor struggles have been suppressed. And, and Definitely. I think that's and in, in Derry, that's a big part of what people will tell you, like mm. um, the kind of conflict which uh, Derry is most famous for, most recently, the Troubles. People say essentially, um, I mean, it started in Derry with uh, a civil rights movement, but it obviously evolved into a kind of struggle for independence and uh, a conflict with the British state. And the focus on that conflict took away any energy to kind of organize in other ways. So yeah. the, the broader history of Irish labor and specifically in Derry is, oh, there's always some other priority to fight against it. A yeah. colonial well, legacy, yeah. yeah, so it never, it didn't really find And I think Eamon, right uh, in place. his book, kind of seminal book about Derry, War in an Irish Town, makes kind of an argument quite explicitly that it was a class, the, the conflict known as the Trouble was really kind of a class war more than anything. It was, it was people, uh, working class Protestants and working class, uh, um, uh, class Catholics who, uh, in a way, were pitted against each other. It was a kind of a capitalist conflict, not a not a religious conflict that it's mm -hmm. framed. That's um, generally was framed in the media. So I think there is there is a kind of a radical past that got lost in Ireland in the beginning of the 20th 20, 20th century. Had a potential to maybe if not become a kind of a socialist state. So definitely not the religious, um, in many ways, quite conservative state. And I think that's. The, the history we wanted to kind of tap into. And I think that's, that's a really good point. That moment of 1913 is so um, loaded with potential because it's before any of those decisions about the state uh, were made. And in a way, we'd love to imagine 2013 or 2113 as another potential moment where, and that's why we asked artists to make work about the future so that we could try to say, maybe this is also the moment before a society is reshaped. So just to uh, think about, I mean, a lot of the work in the show seems to also kind of draw not just on the kind of history and um, kind of labour conditions or preconditions for labour to happen in Ireland, but also kind of on kind of points to a kind of global division of labour. So I don't know, is there any aspect of kind of Olivia's work or so could draw? Yeah, I mean, Olivia, uh, the work we're standing on is, again, looks at the... the early history of conditions of labor as we discussed, but the work behind us looks, or kind of um, makes visual, <laughs> the colonial legacy of this region, essentially the globalization of trade and the kind of status of the worker in that system. Okay, so uh, we have kind of uh, garden designs, early kind of designs for landscape gardens on the floor. And then the, these kind of symbols of agriculture and kind of global trade as kind of subtending the, the kind of edifices of, of British colonial uh, rule. Um, and then here we have these kind of um, almost like neoclassical building blocks and a beehive. Could you? Yeah, sure. So explain um, some of this? the beehive, Olivia has told us, uh, was a very prominent or uh, frequently recurring image in Victorian kind of visual language and it was meant to symbolize uh, the perfectly ordered state. So the queen at the top and everyone knows their place in society. The hive is perfectly organized and works as a functional unit and that is the kind of um, perfection and structure and knowing your place that we should all mm -hmm. um, Kind of harmonious work uh, toward exactly a ecology. humming busy bee kind of thing, but like each in his place. Yeah. So yeah, and I think maybe the blocks. Un Sorry, did you want to say something? About no, but this kind of like how, of course, like like uh, most kind of dictatorial fascist regimes <laughs> try to do. They try and find a proof in other things in nature, usually for their the validity of their kind of structures and society. And I think that's, that's kind of.
Yeah, and I think maybe Olivia tries to give us um, a way out or a little bit of space for reforming um, with the wallpapering and the blocks. Um, and this is just a selection from a broader body of work. Um, but the, uh, on the wallpaper, there are kind of um, drawings of the institutions of society. So they're meant to be like a school, a military training ground, mm -hmm. a church, a house, all of these kinds of uh, the infrastructure of a society. And they're all made with the blocks, or they all can be made with the blocks that are here. But um, obviously, when you just play with the blocks, you come up potentially with more interesting structures. And maybe that's a kind of freer space. But yeah. was, was it you who made the comment about the oh, shapes of the blocks. In, in, yeah, no matter what you make for this, you end up with a neoclassical. Neoclassical. Neo <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's interesting yeah. you pointing out that children always build skyscrapers out of them. Yeah, exactly. That's the one way they can be non flexible, vulnerable kind of structures. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. It's also, I mean, it's also historically like a very important uh, metaphor for the economy. So you have Mandeville's yeah. Fable of the Bees, which is exactly this kind of naturalization of other kind of bee-like, <laughs> industrious, kind of yeah. ordered, harmonious economy. So I think that's quite important in the British imagination. So we're looking at 200, an accumulation of 200 copies of Rosa Luxemburg's Accumulation of Capital. Colin Dark is an artist uh, from England, but he has been based in the north of Ireland for the past 20 years. He was based in Derry for a long time, and now he's living in Belfast. And he is uh, very inspired by kind of Marxist ontology and especially also Brechtian idea, ideas of the epic theatre. So a lot of his work has uh, dealt with kind of specific ideas of, of base and superstructure in Marxist theory. And I think for him, this work was also kind of interesting in a way to, to take the accumulation of capital literally in a way. So he's, he's, um, uh, he requested to buy 200 copies of the same uh, Ruth Ledge Press book, which actually issued a reprint. They didn't have 200 copies in stock. So <laughs> they stop the wheels running again. Uh, yeah. And they were quite suspicious of the idea that an artist would like 200 copies and they, they wanted us they, to make sure that we weren't going to resell the book. They didn't want us to undermine the market, ah, basically. They didn't want us okay. to sell them on at the rate we were at sold the rate. books at. Okay. Exactly. So we had to promise it would only be sold as an artwork. Okay. But, but just for an back. exorbitantly higher price position. Yeah. You yeah. think they'd be pleased or yeah. honored. But, but yes, yeah. uh, so the book, The Accumulation of Capital, which is a kind of a, in many ways, a classic and kind of a socialist literature, uh, came out in 1913. So these 200 uh, books represent 200 years of, of this book. So 1913 until 2113. Um, and Colin's idea was that this is a kind of a permanently unfinished work. Um, it's called the year of the revolution, remove as appropriate or hand over to the barbarians. And that's, uh, <laughs> that's a reference to uh, Rosa Luxemburg herself. She's saying that, you know, um, either capitals will collapse or we'll just hand over to the barbarians. Mm. Socialism uh, or barbarism. Yeah, socialism or barbarism, which is kind of a, probably a, kind of a Hobbes idea. But, but the idea is that if accumulation of capital is going to end, if capitalism will fail us, in the next hundred years, the work you're going to remove the number of books that like, not um, necessary, not necessary. So if it <laughs> ends in uh, uh, 2052, year. then you just kind of remove all the books after that year. Okay. And kind of completes the reshapes piece. the piece. Um, but of course, it is a kind of an interesting like to 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 buy a kind of a book and which is a ready-made and then kind of it is a thing in itself and then it becomes an, both a material for the artwork and then the artwork itself. So it's kind of um, well, a it, status it, where, where he's actually not done anything to the book and it is kind of it is the actual book because people have been curious and thought it was just a cover. And and your impact. He when he gave a talk about the work, he talked interestingly about the status of artist materials and the ready-made in the kind of first and second order categorization of commodities. Is mm. that something you can 
Because you could say this is a because you could say this is a kind of commodity removed from its kind of commodity circuit, like temporarily. This is a, in a way you could talk about yeah, kind of ontology of artworks where they're not they're kind of special forms of commodity. I think is like a common phrase from Stuart Martin or John Robert. But it kind of yeah. But it, I guess it, it was interesting about this, and, and we were asking him if uh, he wanted to kind of activate the piece in some way, you know, to... Could we, we read it could while we read the it? show was on? Group? And he was actually uh, very adamant. He, didn't, he really wanted, in a way, for this kind of uh, source of information, of kind of potentially interesting ideas, to kind of remain mute, in a sense, like mm. to, to display it as kind of, in a way, in a way kind of a dead artwork in that sense, that it wasn't actually uh, an active text that was kind of should be read and discussed. It was really, in a way, kind of taking it and, and making it um, dead in that sense, and also, yeah, taking this kind of uh, the book out of circulation from the market, uh, from the libraries, and making it into kind of just a, a fetish in an art gallery. I think it's interesting as well, just in in terms of maybe some of the other works which we'll talk about later, which do do deal much with more with. Um, kind of well the integration of the third, third world into kind of a global marketplace uh, it's Rosa the sort of situation of, in, a, in a way many ways Rosa Luxemburg has kind of superseded Lenin as a as a kind of Marxist theorist for our times partly because she dealt so closely with this kind of idea of primitive accumulation and also the dependence of like kind of um, maybe sort of the, the kind of centres of capitalism in its relationship to the periphery. So she kind of really looks at that with regards to Egypt and lots of other places. So in, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a kind of interesting that there's a sort of revival of Luxembourg at this, at this moment. And also there's various other organisational differences with Lenin, which are quite significant. Yeah. talking a little bit about what the most recent financial crisis meant specifically in the Irish context um, and the idea of crisis brought us to red alert because I think the, the title is obviously re referring to that moment post 9-11 in America where um, the security situation was always about red alert, green alert, yellow alert, you know, but it was actually never on green. It was either yellow or whatever it goes. Does it go orange red. or red. red? So you're um, always in this state of panic. And I think then um, with the most recent financial crisis, that logic really found its end point. And we are still all these years later, surprisingly to some, maybe. Probably in a worsening in, crisis. In a worsening in a crisis, exactly. Is exactly. So um, if Ireland um, experienced uh, the, their, their first or most um, exaggerated uh, boom and crash, they came into a crash that's maybe the last one and the perpetual one. Yeah, in, as part of a continuum, in a way I was talking about, these, you can see these crises as a continuum. There's a nice uh, phrase that uh, um, an English uh, writer, William Dixon, has, which is he talks about the crisis cat. So the, you've got this cat and you keep on putting it out of the house and it keeps climbing back in the window, <laughs> a different window each time, and it's like a little bit bigger. And it kind of climbed in in 2007, 2008, and it's like this tiger. <laughs> in fact, it's much like, oh, there's not a tiger, there's a lion. The cat came yeah, back. Yeah, the cat it's came back as like this huge beast. Um, I thought it was a goner, but it wouldn't go away. <laughs> yeah. But I think also, what's, in a way, for us, this is a key, it's a very s small piece, in a sense, in kind of how much space it takes up, but uh, in the way that Hito Stero works, she's always incredibly conscious of art history, of kind of the references you use, not just art references, but um, references to social history. And of course, this is a reference to kind of... Uh, the idea of the avant-garde in art as well, the, you know, Rodchenko and the kind of the revolutionary ideas of the early 20th century and how art was going to transform um, humankind. In a way, we see now three monochromes, when it was made 2007, was hardly a kind of a bold statement in a way, if anything, probably underwhelming in its kind of simplicity. But what's interesting about this piece too, which is always the case with Hito's work, 
uh, it's, it's made for a specific device. The device is also kind of telling the story of, of the piece. So these are uh, Apple Mac um, uh, cinema displays, uh, kind, of, kind of the most high-end kind of LCD displays that came up in the early 20, uh, 21st century. And um, they were made for this uh, piece, uh, like she's, uh, she specified. specified for this piece. So they've only been shown in this particular way and in this kind of structure. And, uh, but, but the red image is a continuously rendered uh, move file. It's actually not a still image, it's a film that's going. But you can't, of course, tell the movement. There's this kind of invisible movement. And the computer is trying to constantly render the same image again and again. Uh, and also, uh, that uh, kind of effectively also destroys the, it's the wearing technology. itself out. It wears so, itself yeah. out. So these screens, not for this show, they'll probably be fine afterwards. But but if you continuously screen this piece, it will uh, damage, deconstruct uh, it, deconstruct so. the um, technology in a way. That so there's a kind of, I mean, I would see that almost like so. This kind of a Rodchenko work it references is this kind of. Uh, uh, red, black, and green monochromes, very similar kind of dimensions. Mm -hmm. And in a way, he made those as like a way of almost exhausting painting. So he's like, I have this finished, is this painting. is the end. It, they kind of just draw attention to their support, but they also kind of draw, draw a line under painting. In a way, kind of Hito's also sort of playing on this kind of like, I'm going to try and exhaust this digitality. This is the end of this digital. Yeah. But also, it's the. I don't know, somehow the, how do we relate back in the idea of the red alert and the crisis, like, does the end of something then also mean? It's endless. <laughs> yeah. Endless crisis, like. It was made, yeah, interestingly enough, for documenting 2007, and there was that, that moment, of course, it was like post 9-11, but pre-crash, it was this kind of limbo, and we just had a few years uh, of kind of uh, growth, and, you know, people like Damien Hirst were, selling off their entire year's production for astronomical values and, and Andrea Frazier was selling herself as an artwork to a collector. It was this kind of... Uh, an art boom. An art boom that... In the scariest possible, yeah. most manic way. Yeah. Like, also in that... Yeah, very frenetic and urgent. And then... Like I, yeah. Exhausting just to think about that moment in a way, right? Yeah. And then a work like this, of course, is, yeah, like I said, quite underwhelming and in its kind of immediate display, at the same time, it kind of speaks on so many levels to the kind of the, the, the age we're living in. And the fact that these uh, screens now, it's becoming a very, Hida mentioned in her talk yesterday, that it's hard to find, she finds it hard to find the right technology to even screen her works. So these uh, Apple cinema displays are not available anymore. You have to buy them secondhand. And they cost as much as a new one, even though they're secondhand because you can't get them yeah. rare. And, and because people have a kind of fetish relationship to technology, these ones, I think it's the last screen that has the matte screen before they go to a glossy, hard screen and somehow, like, and in a there way, is something yeah. tactile or special about And the, about the them. artist is kind of also making these even more scary by, by showing this work and... Insisting rent, that people... Uh, and, and basically uh, destroying the screens, too. So in a way, she's undermining the kind of future display of of her own work. Yeah, I think there's a kind of interesting connection to what I was maybe trying to say as well yet a little bit yesterday and with this kind of idea of permanent crisis and kind of yeah. kind of permanent state of destruction is is this kind of um, so it's like hard to say it's almost like Hito as an artist and kind of <laughs> the kind of capitalist conditions of production that are in the competition about who makes this obsolescent <laughs> first yeah, or right. who destroys it first. It's kind of quite challenging because I know that Hito has been going on to make more works about kind of both digital display and and kind of like strike or the idea of a kind of like a, a sort of maybe a sort of resistance to that or a kind of resistance to the conformity that that, that involves um, so in a series of recent pieces so I think it's interesting and also this invisibility question which he yeah, presented to yesterday. film about how to become invisible yeah. how to how, how to not be seen yeah I think there's an interesting kind of, I mean, maybe that's just like generally a theme like of the work. Way. So yesterday, like Hito's film that she screened is kind of the sort of, um, 
in the title it's kind of like uh, this is a fucking didactic video or something like that yeah. and there's a kind of so there's a deliberate kind of over identification with being didactic whereas I think this works quite the opposite and then I think generally for explicitly sort of political work and work that deals with political themes most of the work is like kind of shrinks from that sort of didacticism or, sure, yeah. or at least identification with didacticism so maybe you could talk about that because I think it's very much something that you, you, the kinds of work that you're putting together, it's kind of like early 21st century art, it's, has a lot of like engagement with labour, a lot of engagement with kind of like very current and historical political issues, but I think it often sort of shrinks from maybe the didacticism associated with political art of the past, and maybe as two young curators you could say something about that. Why that's interesting. interesting. Yeah. I think I, yeah, that's definitely true, and I think uh, uh, actually David Panos mentioned, which is a funny remark, but he said he was so happy to be part of this show because it looked so good as well. And that was a very <laughs> interesting remark because, of course... We're interested in aesthetics. But we are interested in aesthetics, and I think, but so are a lot of the artists we were working with, Hido, Colin Dark, yeah, Olivia Plunder, and, all, and, and, and David Panos and Anya Kitchener, too. They're very interested in that kind of, the, yeah, the what the relationship between the appearance of something is and what the kind of the message is. And I think maybe the kind of the, yeah, the tra traditional critique of political engaged art that, that is more interested in kind of reaching, kind of uh, affecting change rather than how it, like it, it you know. It and actually it's something kind of we were criticized sign. for yeah. in the, and actually it was brought out actually that we were too aesthetic again. Anyway, so we That's did an exhibition called okay, yeah, yeah terms of belonging, looking at issues of nationalism um, in, in the Scandinavian context. And again, it was like a show that in its way looks similar to this. It's like the political ideas embedded in the work are abstracted or um, come at from um, less direct angles. And again, we were criticized for it because we really do want to imagine another world, but I think we've just just like exhausted or uninterested or uninspired by mm. didactic approaches. It just doesn't, it's not at, interesting at as time. an art experience and it isn't, mm -hmm. it hasn't affected change. Like we're in a perpetual state of crisis. We don't feel like the contemporary or current political system has really created a space for a new way of structuring society or for imagining the world. So why would we make work that I think it's also a little bit like too instantaneous. There's a kind of feeling now is like, what would it take for change to happen? Is like a very long set of conversations <laughs> yeah, exactly. and struggles and things which would to connect and mesh, which whereas a lot of the, the kind of art, didactic political art of the past assumed an instantaneous solution. Exactly. Or it was like sparking also, a revolutionary, it's just kind of a revolutionary spark. But I, I do think the didactic thing, I, I'm quite interested in that and it's very a lot of the product we've done not well me mostly on my own have been very quite quite like educational in the sense in the in discursive the kind of discursive in the sense that they're they're trying to kind of not just it's a bit of a show and tell maybe it is it's kind of the same way we decided to have an opening and a closing kind of forum or to bring people together not just the artists but speakers to kind of come and reflect on things and I think we find that that's crucial. We, every exhibition we do, we try and have at least some or a couple of those kind of components because it does feel, even though we're very happy with this particular exhibition, it kind of feels sometimes like it's not enough. Like it's kind of, it's not enough it to brings see the word. out, like the conversation we're having now in a way, that's what we want to spark and not you can't do that with every visitor it's very hard to kind of but we try in this organization we try to have somebody say if you want to talk about any of the works in the show we're free to talk about it and we can only do that because it is the scale of organization yep. that it is mm. and this just seems like that you know true to that there's these kind of multiple points of engagement that you've had screenings that you've had kind of talks that you've had two two seminars um, I think, and the publication kind of opens things out. And also in a way, like I think what's quite strong about the publication is that these very multiple points of kind mm. of entry, you know, like different texts that are both kind of maybe a bit academic or historical, mm -hmm. but also kind of like playful and future casting, so.
So we were talking about kind of didacticism versus appearance and aesthetics, and I think it's quite an interesting question to pose in relationship to Anya at Kirshner and David Panos's work, Ultimate Substance, because I think it's you were saying it's like one of the kind of show stealers, yeah, it kind is. of like very very popular, and I think there's something about the kind of um, the quality, not only of the, the images and the sound, yes. um, but like also of the kind of editing, the sort of the, the, the general kind of gleam of those images, um, which is really kind of stunning. And what I guess the way I'd kind of relate that to the themes of the show is that this is very much about this kind of like the interest in the relationship of like a um, of appearance to kind of material substance and to sort of the transformation of material in labour. Into you, abstracted. Yeah, yeah, and abstraction within that. That's um, if you know, but maybe... Anyway, um, David and Anya, you know, do a lot of research and could transform their research into the kind of development of the first coins and the abstraction of the market through that process and its relationship to a, a history of S slavery. slavery. You don't necessarily unpack those the specificity of that research mm. in their work, but I think, um, as you say, the kind of uh, visceral experience yeah. and the aesthetic experience yeah, plays against somehow. I think there's a lot of, there's some kind of element of obfuscation. I think they worked a lot with yeah. the notion of the veil, of the kind of the, the, the veiling of, of also the message in a way. So they shot a lot, they did extensive research um, on the film, looking at, uh, I think, a lot of the gambon. Uh, but then in the end decided to just have short snippets of kind of conversations with this story and talking about the uh, development of um, a kind of monetary economy in ancient Greece. And of course, the narrative arc is uh, the first kind of the ultimate substance as being this coin, which is forged of metals. And the, 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 the ratio between silver and gold varies between every coin. But uh, to make it kind of practical, you know, you assert a symbolic value to the coin, no matter what how much yeah, silver, really how hard. thick it is, or how thin it is, it has the same value. So to kind of create an abstract um, economy. And that kind of is the origin in a way, and then it ends with kind of uh, snapshots of the kind of post-crisis uh, Athens and, and Greece. And, and kind of, you know, maybe full circle, almost to over 2,000 years of kind of human uh, history kind of reduced to 16 minutes. But at the same time, there is... There is so much else in there that's uh, that's rich and it points in so many directions. There is there is a kind of a yeah, I think this thing of the crisis plays out like the writhing bodies and all of that incredibly visceral and sexy material that you really want to spend time watching. Also, somehow has to do um, with protests and crisis and the fervor of being in a crowd. So I mean. Again, you don't want to ascribe um, a definitive interpretation, but there, but those sensibilities cross between the kind of um, historical snippets and the kind of um, sensual and visual experiences of a film, and it's those trying to piece together those um, ideas and experiences that makes it such a rich experience with art. Mm. I was sort of talking about yesterday about how this kind of crisis is also about this kind of like sort of language not necessarily making sense or like gears, not gears of accumulation, not necessarily being able to quite connect to each other or kind of connecting for a bit and then collapsing again. And I think there's that sort of sense in, in that film in particular of like you see, you know, kind of like edited together all this kind of like diverse kind of incredibly stunning images, but like very, you know, kind of like from different places and from very different times um, of different materials, different qualities of materials. Yeah. And, um, you know, kind of almost not in a linear way, not put into a kind of narrative at all, just kind of, kind of jumbled up as these kind of edited shots. Um, but then also you've got kind of like on another track, a kind of very powerful soundtrack, um, mm. sometimes associating with the sound. Yeah, it's very kind of important that it has a 
has a very powerful subwoofer and there is a there's the physicality kind of physical, physical, feeling, physical like presence the in this space. Breaking of the rock, yeah. and that process of making is like reverberates and, uh, in your body. But I think there is something also in relation to what Hida was talking about yesterday. Post production, uh, the ultimate substance film is sitting. It, you can just see the amount of labor in post production. Mm. There is, you know, there's the green screen, there's the after effects, but also all that editing. You know, um, just speaking to David and Anya about it, like. That at the, actually one of the cinematographers was devastated when they saw the end result because they <laughs> cut out so much stunning, beautiful right. imagery and just kind of or just gave it, it a flash. Or gave it a flash <laughs> instead of like so in a way it's kind of a tease. So they spend all this money making a film that could have probably been twenty hours long, really, and it reduced it to to kind of um, and cut out a lot of the the, the quite um, uh, visually stunning and captivating material, but. Again, I think it's kind of the filmic medium becomes quite evident in that thing. It's like a very clear that this is not uh, a, somebody's not trying to tell you a simple story from A to Z, it's, or to uh, trick you through all those tropes of narration. Mm. No, and I think it's kind of it maybe going back to kind of ideas of epic theater in a way. You are quite aware of that you're watching a film. You're quite aware that you're in a room. That's kind of it's 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 first quite. Um, quite uh, all-encompassing, but as your eyes adjust, you can see more and more of the details, see all how it's kind of laid out. Um, they're not exposing it that much. It's not kind of, uh, you, you see all the kind of the, the, um, uh, the well, it's not a transparent piece in that sense, but it is, it's quite, uh, it's hard to be fully kind of engrossed by, by the narrative and by the film. You're always kind of cut, cut off uh, in a thought or in a kind of an image. Is it Marianne Flotron? Oh yeah, Marianne Flotron. Okay. So, um, in the upstairs space, funnily, like in a disused office space that's in the building that we occupy, um, we had a work called Work by Marianne Flotron. And she worked closely with a Augusto Boal Theatre of the Oppressed practitioner. And she went into a Dutch insurance company that is um, supposedly has a flat structure is maybe what we imagine or what I associate with a kind of Google office model mm -hmm. um, type work environment with flexible work hours and leisure space and all of this kind of thing and started to um, through the Bowal techniques to unpack um, the kind of conditions of labor in, in that environment and uh, what the hierarchies are and uh, what it actually does to people to work there. Mm. Well, I think it's kind of what's interesting about that thing is that it's a it's a kind of a work environment that have embraced kind of contemporaneous uh, uh, conditions of labor. It's a kind of a it's a self um, self reflexive work environment. They know that the workers are individualist. They're they're their careerists. They want to kind of embrace their own kind of inner kind of ambition and criticality. So they're they're saying basically up to yourself you make your own hours you work when you want if you want to read the paper for two hours go ahead no problem you know as long as you kind of deliver in the end it doesn't matter how target. you structure your time so it's this kind of illusion of the kind of the, the you know you're like freelancer in a sense you're like you have your work you have your salary but really you just come and go as you please uh, you kind of your boss is your friend you know you're all kind of on a journey together so it really is the kind of the, the, the in a way, 100 years ago, there was this kind of 
uh, desire for you know eight hours of work, eight hours of leisure time, eight hours of rest. Uh, that model has now kind of been replaced permanently with this kind of where work is kind of always happening and never happening mm. in a sense, which of course means for the most part that people work more, way more than they do. But they, they have this kind of, they're in this golden cage scenario where they feel empowered. Mm. They, by the illusion. By the illusion of having yeah. freedom and free time. And I think by this book, uh, Gustav Ball expert, um, Hector, it's kind of by posing a very simple question. He's kind of, kind of just uh, kind of gets at, it's like picking at a scab or something like that. He gets at this, uh, the fact that these people, they're, they've kind of bought into this illusion of having um, just a kind of a, you know, like they're, they're, they're really free and they're working because, not because they have to, they choose to work and they like, they like their work and they can move on at any time and there's these kind of free agents and they have complete um, uh, uh, b- both autonomy and also agency in their work environment and it becomes incredibly evident that that's, that's uh, most people don't feel that. That's well, it. they've internalized the kind of structures that deliver what the company needs. Yep. They're self-policing and incredibly anxious. And the work, maybe it's worth noting, is um, quite polyphonic insofar as um, there are Hector's reflections on what it's been like to, to, to carry work. out these workshops with Marianne. Um, and there are interviews with people who actually work, including the Five HR years. person, which is like mm. the most revealing part. And then there are, um, there's a double projection where you see people who work there playing out scenarios and using them for wall <coughs> technique. So um, you're really getting in from a number of mm. yeah, But it's funny because it, like a lot of the people didn't want to participate in that kind of workshops either. They're sitting there and they're sitting and drinking their cappuccino. And trying to get away. Their, Trying like like embarrassingly looking over their shoulder, trying to kind of they're aware of it in one way, but they also they don't want to open the kind of the floodgates of actually questioning what their work environment looks like. They really are quite they they they're only comfortable in the illusion that there are this kind of autonomous uh, um, free laborers free, free labor that just kind of come and go as they please. I think, I mean, I think part of uh, the kind of terrifying aspect of that is just like how much these people's kind of lives and expectations have been kind of integrated, how kind of normal this kind of setup is in, the, in a very sort of, okay, it's not what you'd think of as the kind of creative sector, you know, no, sort of the right. reinsurance industry, but it's like somewhere that they, like they're clearly probably a firm that thinks of themselves on the cutting edge of kind of new management techniques and employee relations but just a the way that their staff talk about kind of like almost like a total integration of the character of a worker of their home life of their sort of like an absorption and surveillance which is not not very different from actually uh, Henry Ford's vision he used to spy on his workers on their health and sexual and leisure habits like their drinking and kind of alarm bells would go off and he would fire certain workers if he felt that their, their kind of life outside work, like challenged Couldn't his control of them inside work. Yeah. But, think, yeah, but there was yeah. another um, point because in a way the sort of Hector's kind of uh, exercises, I think there's this like kind of very blurry line where you're like, is this a, an even worse integration of kind of like their criticisms and their sort of quite, quite you know, like their own aspirations and quite personal stuff that comes out in those exercises, it gets played you're sort of like, oh no, this could be worse. It's you know? getting worse. No, I think that's a really interesting. And, and somebody like, the thing that was interesting about that work, uh, we came across it a few years ago, but what was interesting about Northern Ireland and the context here is that, like, uh, in a way, since the peace process began, kind of Northern Ireland have been kind of workshopped to death in a way. Okay. There's been so much peace and reconciliation, especially like theater of the oppressed, like acting out the kind of the conflict and like, how, you know, tell us how you feel and some of the police come knocking on your door, tell us how you feel when your son got shot by an Irish mm-hmm. volunteer. Like all of that kind of has been played out here in a way. Using those know. exact techniques. Yeah. Exact yeah. techniques, and it's, but it's, it has in a way... Same, using Hector. Using Hector <laughs> himself. The same, the same kind of figure appears in the film. So that was another layer of complication, but I do think, uh, yeah, th- that's what I'm 
trying to express like that 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 kind of company they're so uh, they're so well aware that they need to be they 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 want their employees to be critical and they also want to be seen as critical and self reflexive and always kind of Adaptable. adapting and kind of integrating criticism in a way so I think the the reason Marianne because she has a double agenda at least I think and mm. she's inviting him to kind of to expose that but she's also trying to expose in some way the kind of what these methods and these things also do and how they can be used as a tool to yeah to kind of worsen in a sense to kind of deepen the kind of the the, the uh, precarity of, of these workers that they're she's bringing in this person to and paid for by the company and in a way that they're doing that they're agreeing to that because they think that they can do <coughs> Uh, their workers kind of well, and they'll glean there. information about their workers mm. that they might not already know. I think it's worth saying also, um, maybe about being a bit reflexive about what it means to work in art.